All right, we're back again with another great episode of PFREI. I'm your host, Fuquan Bilal. Oh man, today we got a great show. I actually interviewed her dad a little bit more than a year ago, and um, it was it was a pleasure. But um, Isabel Guarino said it right. Yes, yeah. so I'm going to read a little bit about your bio, a list a little bit because I tend to butcher people bio, but I want to read it because I, I when I when I was reading it. I saw that you transitioned from a flight attendant to the business that you're in now. So yeah. uh, I know that you graduated from Arizona State University. And basically, I just mentioned you was a flight attendant. You did some stuff interning with Walt Disney um, and Residential Assistant Living Academy, right? That's what you are doing now. So I'm going to let you really introduce yourself to my audience and kind of talk a little bit more about this business. I know there were some challenges during COVID that a lot of people in this business had. And, you know, we'll talk about how now what's happening in today's market, if that's affecting you guys at all or your business model. So welcome to the show. Really appreciate you scheduling time to uh, speak to me to educate our audience more about what you do. So tell me a little bit about how you guys started. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, we got started uh, with my grandmother. She actually needed assisted living and couldn't live on her own anymore. And so we were searching for a place for her. So it really started organically with my own family. And she was living in upstate New York at the time. And every home we visited, we were just like disgusted with. Like, I didn't want to leave my goldfish, let alone my grandma there. They were terrible. They were expensive. They were full with waiting lists. And it was like, this can't be all that there is, you know? Uh, we were living in Phoenix at the time and we're like, hey, a lot of people live here. There's got to be more options here. So we started searching for something out this way and really stumbled into residential assisted living. And my dad did quick math and he's like, wait, I'm going to be paying five grand a month for her to live in one of these homes or we could own the real estate, own the business. She could live for free and we could cash flow 10 grand a month. So it was a pretty easy decision to get into the business. Um, and I watched him do that for about two years before I started saying, hey, what, what's going on over here? What are you doing? And slowly kind of weaseled my way in to become his assistant and then eventually his COO and um, now the lead educator for uh, Residential Assisted Living Academy. Mm, that's awesome. So why are you passionate for real estate investing? Is, you know, is it that or more so of the assistant living business? I really love assisted living for sure. Like real estate investing is cool to me, but, for, but I, I'm like hype on senior housing because when we look at the trends and demographics, this is something that we're going to be seeing for the next 10, 20, 25 years as a major market. And a lot of people don't know how to get involved. So to me, this is a really great opportunity, not only to cash flow and use real estate background and skills, but also to make a huge impact on your community. We don't have enough quality care homes. We don't have enough caregivers. We don't have enough of anything. We're currently 1.3 million beds short. Um, and the baby boomers aren't in assisted living yet. And we're about to double the amount of seniors who need the care. And so to me, it's just like this massive supply and demand, like the writings on the wall, this is a crisis or the biggest opportunity that we've ever faced. And so I, I just love that. I'm very, very uh, into senior housing as my real estate investment, you know, choice for sure. Mm -hmm. I like it because it's it's so many different parts of real estate, right? So I interview people all the time and, you know, there's people who do storage, there's people who do multifamily, guys who do fix and flip, wholesale, lending, and, you know, senior home. So it's like a business within a business because you get the cash flow from the real estate and from the business. Yes. Um, you said you do education on this. So how tough is it for someone to get started? And what do you think makes the best candidate of or type of person to do this business? Is it somebody Great. that needs real estate yeah. background or? Great question. I think um, it can be tough to get started because this isn't something that like, it's not like fix and flip. Like it's not on HGTV for a reason. There's a lot of rules and regulations. There's a lot of licensing and there should be. These are people's lives, you know, that we're dealing with. And I think that the rules surrounding this are good if it, we should have probably more than there even are. So the hoops to jump through really turn off some people who want 
easy investments. They want fast cash. They want get rich quick. That's not what this is, right? Yes, the cash flow is amazing and the ROI can be amazing, but there's a lot of work to do and hoops to jump through to get there, to get to the passive where you're like me going to the home every other month, doing one phone call a week, cash flowing over 10K on one home. That takes a lot to get to that point, you know? So it's definitely not the easiest thing to do. I feel like the best person to get involved in this is either a real estate investor or a medical professional. I see a lot of those two categories of people who really just get this industry. And especially if those are partnered together, whether it's a husband, wife or brothers or you know, father, daughter, whatever it is, that's a great blending of those two businesses in one. I will say, though, that the number one trait that it doesn't matter if you're 22 years old or 72 years old, the number one trait to have in this industry is grit, right? In all of real estate investing, but really senior housing, you've got to be willing to get punched in the face and get back up and go again. You know, like that, that's what it's going to (laughs) take. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's, uh, you got to, you're absolutely right. You have to be able to have the grit to to go through it because it's not just you know all good right you got to go the good bad and ugly and to be able to get up and and start over again so let's go back a little bit i know there were some challenges during covid where this industry got hit really hard how did you guys bounce back from that for us it was actually kind of a good thing. It shined a lot of light on the big boxes. So the Brookdale Sunrise Atrium, the commercial facilities, and the lack of care and attendance to the seniors in those homes. In our homes where there's only six to 16 seniors in the home, and the ratio of care is four seniors to one caregiver, we actually started having waiting lists because people were ripping their parents out of the big boxes where it's 30 seniors to one caregiver, right? It shined a huge light on it that, oh my God, this is terrible. Like these seniors are just being abandoned, left alone. They're not getting proper new nutrition and sunlight and interaction. And in our homes, we kind of ran things pretty normally because it's already smaller. I don't have to worry about so much in and out. There's not a front desk girl and a janitor and a chef and all of this. It's the same caregivers coming and going every day. So it was a lot easier to control. There was a ton of articles at the time that were saying like smaller is better. And it was like, we've been saying this for years. And now all of a sudden everyone wants to catch on. But it was a good thing for for us in residential assisted living. It definitely shined a poor light on commercial assisted living. um, And I think rightfully so. Hmm. Now, how does this this the the market with interest rates being high and everything else? How does that, if at all, affect this business? Because, I mean, you have the underlying real estate, which rent stays the same. Right. I mean, if you own it, and you're trying to refinance the real estate. Then I can see the effect in that. But the assisted living business. Have you guys had any business slow down? Does these markets with inflation, everything kind of slow business down for you or people wanting to wait longer to relocate their parents or trying to find the best deal in town? How does that affect you guys at all? With the cost of real estate being shaky right now, right? It's up in a lot of markets still and interest rates are high and and things kind of feel weird. And like, should I be buying something right now? Should I be doing a massive renovation? It definitely scares some investors away. But we always say it's the the investment doesn't matter. It's about the opportunity. If the dollars make sense on the bottom line, who cares if you paid full price for that house, right? You're, you're buying the house and you're dating the rate. The rate's always going to change. So you can always refi later on that. But the house, as long as the numbers make sense and you can pay that, it works out in the end. We also have to remember the income from the business is from the residents. So it's just like minimum wage. If we want to increase minimum wage, guess what? The cost of the hamburger goes up. If we want to increase the cost of homes, the cost of them living in the home goes up. It doesn't really affect me. It's it's simple economics, right? It goes down to the bottom line and it's going to start affecting the seniors. So the nicer the home, the more the senior is usually paying to live in it. And the shittier the home, the less they're paying to live in it. It just is what it is. Of course, their level of care is also going to be determined in the cost that they're, you know, having to live in the home because it's not just about the room. It's also about their care. If they just have minor dementia issues versus 
they can't walk, they need to be fed, they need to be bathed, that's going to cost more. So there's some different things that go into it. But the real estate, it really just falls to the bottom line. And as long as the numbers work, it we can make it work all day. So I don't mind in a good market, bad market, I'll pay full price for a house all day, because it's it doesn't really matter. It's the opportunity for us. Mm, great, great, great answer. But what about the risk that's involved with this model? What are some of the things that you guys see uh, that you also shine a light to the people you're educated and say, hey, here's the model, here's the risk you have to look out for, and then here's how you mitigate that risk? Definitely some things that come to mind. People are always fearful of liability, right? Like what happens if someone dies in the home? What happens if someone gets hurt in the home? The reality is if a 105-year-old senior is moving into an assisted living home, the family is aware that they are on their way to heaven, right? Like this isn't something that they're going to magically heal from and get another 20 years of life back at home. It's not. So 95% of people will pass in the home and it's not a shock when, when 99 year old grandma dies. It, it is a shock when a nine year old gets hit by a car, that's not supposed to happen. Right. But when you're older and you're aging and you're already kind of falling apart mentally, physically, everything like that, that's the direction it's headed. These, these are your last years of life. So it's kind of uh, not as big of a deal as you might think not being in the industry. These families are kind of expecting it at some level, um, but injury and liability against injury for your caregivers, for the seniors, for anyone in the home. There's a lot of things that we teach about getting the home senior safe, you know, ramps and guardrails, handrails. In residential assisted living, you don't have to be ADA compliant, but you probably want to be as close as possible because all those things are going to help mitigate risk. They're going to help you have safety within your home. So not a bunch of different flooring, like nice, smooth uh, floors all throughout the house, different things like that. Um, and then, of course, having liability insurance. It's about a dollar or two per day per resident. So if you have 10 residents, it's a line item at 300 to 600 bucks a month. You're going to pay it, but it's going to protect you and your residents and your staff. And then different things like having cameras and making sure that your staff is really, really going through those background checks, going through your home rules and regs and like following your standards. There's a bunch of different things that you can do to kind of ease those worries and fear. But definitely, I think of liability when I think of mitigating risk and making sure to protect yourself. Hmm. So, so, okay. so the business model is, is it always to try to get the real estate to do this business model? Or do you do you teach both? If you find a location, lock up a long term lease and then run a business model till you find something to buy. Is it you know, what do you see the best benefit of? From the real estate side, you can kind of get in four ways. One, you could buy land, build a custom home from the ground up. We have a lot of our students who do that, especially if you live in a state like Texas, Illinois, New Jersey, Ohio, where you're allowed to have 16 residents. You're not going to find a 15, 16 bedroom home on the market, more than likely, unless you're buying 50 cents house. So you're going to have to build something, basically. So buying land, custom build, that's one way. Number two is buying a single family home. And when I say that, I don't mean a three bed, two bath, right? I mean something probably a bit larger. Maybe it's already a six bed and you're going to turn it into an eight or a 10 by chopping it up differently, right? But a larger single family home that you're going to convert to become an assisted living, Three, you can lease a home for this. So like you're saying, you know, you could work with someone who's going to be the landlord. Maybe they've retrofit the house to have it ready for assisted living, or they're partnering with you, understanding the renovations you're going to be doing to make it, you know, an assisted living home. And you're leasing it from them and going to run that business within the home. Uh, Fourth, you could buy an existing one. About 30,000 of these care homes exist across the country today. And a lot of them are being run mom and pop style, meaning the person who owns the home is also working in the home and wiping the senior's bum and cooking all the food and doing it all. And at about six, seven years, there's a lot of burnout. So there's opportunity to purchase these businesses for pretty inexpensively because they're not professional business owners. They don't really know what they're doing. They got into it for the heart side of it. Um, And you could get a pretty good deal of a home and the business that's already up and running. Mm, that's great. That's great. Thanks for sharing that. Let's share some information, websites, social media stuff. When is your next training? How often do you do them? 
Next training is March 2nd through the 5th. We do them about every six to eight weeks. So that will be training number two of the year. So we'll have six more after that. Um, and you can definitely find more information at ral101.com. I've got uh, free calls with me or my team. You can grab a free book, webinar, whatever you like there. And on social media, we are pretty much on TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, you name it, at RAL Academy. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. Thanks for sharing this information. And for those of you who had the opportunity to catch this, if you're interested in, in this business model, highly recommend um, to connect with them to get the education and the training that you need. Right. A lot of people, when they go into real estate, and I do have one more question that just came to mind, but a lot of people, when they go into real estate, they try to figure out um, the first thing is a fix and flip. That's a lot of work. I do that model to this day. And I was just actually on a call with my team and saying, we want to get um, the business to a point where it's 75% of rentals versus fix and flips. So if you can find another model like senior home where you have a business that can consistently bring cash flow and you own the real estate um, and where it's like a separate business, essentially, you're paying the, you're the landlord on one end, you're paying yourself there, and then you have a business that's cash flowing, I think is a great opportunity. The other question I was asking is, what does it cost to get, get this started? I know there's certain licenses the person need and uh, requirements. But for someone looking to get into this business model, um, I know ground up, it could vary all over the place. But I don't know if you had like a cost at the top of your mind if somebody needs to have at least $150,000 or be able to get a line of credit for X amount. Yeah, it, that, it definitely ranges based on which of those four categories you're choosing to do. And then also where you are in the country, right? Like we have students in Oklahoma who are in for 200 K and people in New Jersey who are in for 2 million, like it yeah, completely yeah. ranges. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I will say in our training, we really encourage to use OPM, other people's money, whether it's SBA 7A loans, they're really friendly with this type of business. So that's a good way to go doing syndication, private money, hard money, whatever it is, but not using your own money for this because it does, it, it's not the cheapest thing in the world to get into, right? It's definitely a higher level of real estate investing that maybe, uh, I always tell newbies, like, why would you find your mentor and see where they are now? Why would you start at the beginning where they are? Start where they are now, like mm -hmm. jump to that. Like there's no reason to work up that same way. You know, you could just start where they are. So like you're saying, you're like, hey, I'm, I've been doing this, but I'm ready to move on. Everyone who's listening and loves to follow you and, and wants to be like you, it's like, listen to what he's doing. Jump there. Like, you don't, he, he made the mistakes for you. You don't have to make them now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Endgame. Oh, there's some soft costs involved. A buddy of mine, actually, Rob um, Negligent, he's in PA. He just did one from the ground and he got the SBA loan. Yeah. Um, but they didn't give him 100%. He had to put out like his construction drawer. They came back, they gave him the money. So there's some soft costs that's involved that, you know, go along with it. That's kind of more what I was speaking to of, you know, 50, 60, 100,000. Even if you raise a, uh, have a PPM and you raise the capital, you got to pay the attorney first to do the documents to get it ready. That's about 25, 30 grand. That you can get back, but there's some soft costs that got to be put out. So just want to yeah. make that clear. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I I just wish it was something. I got a business idea. Everybody, give me the money. <laughs> <laughs> you got to have some skin in the game, right? Yeah, at some at some level for sure. Absolutely. Well, it was great speaking with you. I really appreciate you coming on the show. It's another great episode of PFREI, a passion for real estate investments. If you guys catch this on YouTube, before be sure to like and share this and catch us on all the other social media channels. It was great speaking with you today. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks for having me.